I don't know to many of you, how is the end of the world like for you? How, what do you think is the end of the world? Is it when you have no handphones to, pay, uh, to play? Or is it when uh, there's no friends for you to hang out with? Is it when there is no job, no spouse, uh, no, no job, no uh, achievement, no success in life? Actually, we have all been always confirming God's promises every time when we come to church. So besides the very important uh, reminder that God loves us, what do you think is the next most important reminder that we need to bear in our mind? Uh, actually, I believe that uh, besides the, the very strong promise that God is always with us, God loves us, the next most important thing we need to remember is that this world is not our permanent home. Remembering that is uh, remembering that the world is not a permanent home can affect us in many ways. It will direct our priorities and it will also affect what upsets us or not upset, uh, or not upset us. You know, next time when we go back to heaven, God is not going to ask you, how many A's do you receive in your uh, result sleep? God is not going to ask you, how many places in the world have you traveled around for tour? God is not going to ask you, you know, how much you earn every month, even though this is something we're very concerned about. Uh, you know, as we look for job and as we work. Uh, God is not going to ask us how many, how many followers you have on your IG or you know, how many friends you have, whether you have kids or not, whether you're married or not. God is not going to ask you for all those things. So we know that these, even though, are things that we care about a lot as we live on earth, but we need not be too proud or too upset whether or not we have those things, those things that I mentioned. You know, sometimes people get upset, sometimes people get envious because they have or don't have certain things. But what is more, what is more important is that we know God's purpose for us on earth and we can live out that purpose of God while living here on earth. And we always say that the end is very important. You know, we always say that we need to do things with an end in mind. Otherwise, we will go around in circles and we will not be productive, we will not be fruitful, we will waste our time and we will live in vain and get busy for nothing. And so that's why today, Jesus tells us what's happening at the end of the age. You know, uh, so today's passage is what we uh, know from Matthew chapter 24. It's a very familiar passage. Initially, I was thinking whether I should skip this because a recent weekend, we've been hearing it on the Sunday uh, and DT uh, over at the Chinese service. But I believe it is God's timing that He bring all the messages together because He wants to drum it into us that this end time is not a joke. Even though we don't feel it all the time, even though it's not so distinctive to us as we get busy in our daily living, it is real and it's happening. And so today, let's read Matthew 24 again. Matthew 24, verse 1 and 2 first. Okay, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its building. Now here, it's very simply put as its building. But the same uh, passage in Mark 13 actually said that it is, it's very magnificent building. So it's very grand buildings. And so, uh, verse 2, so the, the disciples were very excited to show Jesus how, how spectacular uh, the, the buildings are. But Jesus replied, do you, see, do you see all these things? He asked. Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. So the interesting answer from Jesus is the same question he's also asking us today. Do you see these things? So what are these things referring to? Uh, you know, now we don't see Jerusalem. Actually, I go and Google. Uh, actually, I wanted to put the Jerusalem Temple's picture here. But if you compare to the modern buildings, you will, you will not find that magnificent. You will, you will not find that very splendid. But back in those days, it's really very magnificent. You know, all the temple uh, to the Israelites. This is the grand temple of Jerusalem. But even and back then, the, the, the people of Israel, they feel that this is such a strong building, temple of Jerusalem, it's very hard to destroy. But the truth is, we have the benefit of history and we know that it has been almost completely destroyed in AD 70 by the Rome. So what are these things referring to? These things refers to things that are very lovely, uh, the successful things on earth that attracts us. So the key is, no matter how beautiful the things of the world looks like, they will pass away one day. They will not last forever. So for ourselves, we need to, at this, at this moment, when we want to relate to God's word, we need to think for ourselves, what do you think 
are some things that are very grand to you, very exciting to you, uh, that means a lot to you. You know, for many of us, uh, we all fancy different things. It, it can be, you know, um, okay, so things, that, so things that attract you. I think there's thousand and one things. I cannot possibly list out everything. It could be a new handphone, you know, things that had ever excite you, ever. You know, to the more mature people, uh, they may be looking at cars. You know, recently, my husband, don't know why, suddenly look at cars. He said, our car is expiring soon. I don't know. <laughs> but, so, you know, is it some new car that gives you some excitement ever? Or, you know, it could be a new house for some of you who are getting married or going to be married. Or is it like a perfect beach wedding that we have been dreaming about, you know, for the girls that, oh, we want a perfect wedding. We want this, we want that. You know, all these things and many, many more. You know, at, at first, we can be very delighted, you know, for the children when you first touch your personal handphone. Wow, you feel so special. I finally have my own number, my own uh, social media account, my own uh, handphone to own. But uh, all these things, you excite you for a while. You are delighted for a moment. Then after that, what happened? After that brief moment of delight, what happened next? And as we recall certain once glamorous people or events in the world, what happened to them now? You know, you remember the once famous or uh, renowned politicians, celebrities, even uh, world events. You know, like we just have this craze over World Cup. But after two years, do you still remember who kicked what? Uh, or what happens during the World Cup? You know, all these things, they pass away. They vanish. You know, they just, they just capture our attention for a moment. It makes our heart stir up and get so excited for a while. But along with the, with the excitement they generated, very soon, we know they will be forgotten. And very soon, we will get stuck in other pursuits. We will get burdened with other things that we do not have, other things that we want. So that's why Jesus keeps telling us, do not be deceived. Uh, now we are pursuing all these things and we are excited about all these things, but do not be deceived. You know, people of the world, they always talk about and they always hope for this thing called a better tomorrow, a better world. You know, people always have this hope. I mean, it's good to be optimistic. It's good to be positive. But the truth is, even though we have this dream, we want a better tomorrow, we want a better world, but uh, as far as this current world is concerned, the Bible tells us the truth that it will not be the case because the world will just get from bad to worse until it got totally destroyed and Jesus comes again and brings a what? A new world. And that is the, that's when the better tomorrow will start. But as far as this world is concerned, it will just get worse and worse. So we need to, as we read the word of God, we also need to confirm, is this just black and white words in the Bible or is it really true? So we need to confirm, is the world really passing away? Think about uh, different, different areas of the world. Things like morality, you know, uh, there's that with the advancement of technology, there's more and more sophisticated crime. You know, as I reflect through, you know, last time when I watched Crime Watch, people go through the hassle of you know, breaking into the house with the hammer, with the bag, so leche, and they only rob one house, get uh, maybe a few thousand dollars, a few hundred dollars. Now with the technology, you know, people just do some scam, they can strike so many people and they can, uh, they can get a lot, a lot, they can cheat a lot of money. So morality is getting from bad to worse even with the advancement of technology. You know, people hack into things, people do a lot of scams. And even the environment, environment is falling apart also. We saw natural resources depleting, pollution rising. I don't know whether I shared with you all before, I have this very young uh, cousin who just recently got married and he said that he's not going to have any children. I was very surprised. I was like, why, why are you not having any children when you can? He say, oh, because I look at the world, you know, the natural resources are depleting. I, I concern, I worry about my child. I scared that next time they have not enough gas, not enough uh, no, no, polluted air, or don't know what. So he's concerned about all these uh, natural resources uh, passing away. And that is, that is a reality. People can, people sense it when they read the news. And all kinds of illnesses are emerging in this world. And also, uh, for the human side, we have we can observe there's declining spirituality. And that's why, that's why Jesus continued to say in verse, verse, and of course there's many other evidences that we can observe how the world is passing away. And that's why Jesus moves on to tell us the other sign of how this world is passing away. So verse 3, we continue reading Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, 
when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So these two things are together. It's distinct but together. When Jesus returns again, it will be the end of this age, the end of this world. And Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I'm the Messiah. Messiah meaning Saviour. And, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumours of wars. But see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. So you observe this verse 6, such things must happen. So it doesn't mean that all these things happen means tomorrow Jesus will come again. But all this will happen, but the end is still a distance away. It's still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Okay, we'll explain about this later, but verse 9. Then you'll be handed over to, to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And because of the increase of wickedness, so towards the end time, morality will decline, wickedness will increase, and the love of most will grow cold because we don't know who to trust anymore. No, the, the love grow cold because we have been loving and getting disappointed, being hurt. So people just give up loving. And, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So one thing, so we are all clear, the end is surely coming. And so one thing we need to do during these end times, uh, before you can do anything, uh, you know, go out and uh, evangelize is watch out that no one deceive you. Before we can proactively doing, before we can proactively do anything, we need to guard ourselves from deception first. Because why? Because if we are not careful, the culture and the ways of this world, including the teachings in some churches, they actually deceive people. And to be honest, if we are upright, we need to. We also realize that we are easily deceived people. You know, just uh, for one, uh, we, uh, uh, we mentioned earlier on, we are so easily deceived by glamorous things, by things that excite us, that stir our desires, as what we shared just now. But at the same time, in verse 5, Jesus also told us that many people will come in Jesus' name, claiming to be, to be the Messiah, claiming to be Saviour. Now, because the world also knows that people desires, desire to be saved, but the question is, what exactly do the people of the world want to be saved from? So you ask yourself, what do you want to be saved from today? You can tell from your prayer, you want to be saved from inconveniences, you want to be saved from trouble, you want, be, you want to be saved from busyness, from stress, from boredom. You know, people of the world, they are easily bored. They want to be saved from boredom, from discontentment, etc. In other words, if you really observe people's desires and needs, um, more often than not, what they truly desire to be saved from are things of the world, you know, the problems of the world, the busyness of the world, the discontentment of the world. But very few people, is, uh, very few people are interested about getting saved from hell, from sin, uh, from a bad relationship with God and so on. And so that's why the world knows our need and desires. And that's why many saviors in the world, they will claim what? They will claim, this is the way to happiness. This is the way to meaning of life. This is the way to freedom. And so, and when they say this is the way to happiness, this is the way to freedom, their this is the way. Their way refers to what? Their way can refer to things like, you know, earning big bucks over a short period of time. It can mean an indulgence in our desire. It can mean, uh, you know, you can anyhow uh, fall in love. Or it can mean you can even choose when you want to die, euthanasia and so on. So the solution, the saviour, the, the salvation, so-called, that many people are offering are not exactly the same as what the Bible is telling us. And that's why uh, the Bible even cautioned that there are so many people offering way of salvation, offering the way out, such that even the elect may be deceived. We didn't read verse 24, but verse 24 says that, you know, the false messiahs, the false saviors, they will appear and perform a lot of great signs and wonders. Great signs and wonders of what? Of healing, of miracle, of prosperity. And 
is so wonderful. The signs and the, and, the, and the wonders, the miracles that they perform are so attractive. You know, give you prosperity. Who doesn't want pr uh, prosperity? Give you healing. You know, who doesn't want to be healed and do not want to suffer any, any pain, any, any, uh, any suffering? And so, it's so attractive that even the elect can be deceived. And so you see, it's so scary. Even the elect who know the truth of God, we can be deceived. And why are we so prone to being, dece to, to, uh, to, to being deceived? It's because of the motive of our heart. Uh, if we are upright, we will realize that there are certain things that we have wanted more than God himself. Uh, we want convenience, but not the cross. We want comfort, but we do not want the cross. And when we have all these motives inside our heart, it's very easy for us to be deceived and led astray. It, it becomes a very easy entry point for the devil. And so, we need to know that in the end times, Satan is all the more nervous. Meaning, as the, as the, near, as the end draws nearer and nearer, Satan is really all out for attack, attacking the church, attacking even the elect. And that's why, because he's cunning, we need to be on our guard. Doesn't mean that we know a lot of uh, truth. Doesn't mean that we come to church every day, uh, not every day, every week, then we are guarded. And so, if we want to be alert, we need to understand the signs of the end time. And that's why today, um, Jesus lists down some, some signs of the approaching end. But I want to emphasize that these are signs of the approaching end, but not the end itself. So that's why Jesus mentioned this is the beginning of birth pains, right? Beginning means uh, you already, for those pregnant before, you know the contraction already started, but he doesn't know you will last for 6 hours, 12 hours, 36 hours, you know, some people 36 hours, then the child come out. So it's just the beginning. And so today, we will take a quick reflection, quick recap on all these various signs. I'll just summarize in seven of them. Uh, I've already covered in the end times, you will observe there's a lot of false messiahs, meaning false solution. People offer, you know, the world knows people are looking for prosperity. People are looking for happiness. And the world tries to offer you a way to happiness, which is apart from God. And of course, we will hear of wars and rumors of wars. That, that ref refers to international hostility and uh, also, of course, personal rivalry. And in this modern age, uh, it is not unusual for us to hear not just the, the, the key, you know, violent war. There's a lot of keyboard warriors, you know, having a lot of online wars, using the keyboard and shooting at one another, you know, uh, even not just shooting personally. Shoots at, you know, Christians, you know, there's lobby groups, there's activ activists, uh, they can shoot a lot of things, they cross attack each other when they have different, when they have different opinions. So there's a lot of uh, rivalry around in these end times. And of course, there's also natural disasters, earthquakes, famines, and persecutions. Persecution of Christians and followers of Christ. That may even lead to death. So this refers to external opposition. Uh, and even in recent time, we heard that a lot of terrorist attacks actually focus and targets Christians and churches. So this is happening. And not just external oppositions, we also observe there's internal church problems as well, where you know you see that uh, people claiming to be Christians, but they turn away from their faith, and you know then they may even become false prophets, and all these people who turn away from their faith, they are more little, they are more fatal than uh, other people who are non-Christian. You know why? Because when a person say, "Oh, you know, I've been a Christian before, but I I'm no longer a Christian," I tell you why. What well, their testimony is going to be more disturbing than someone who is never a Christian before. So there's a lot of internal church problems also. Of course, when people turn away from the faith, uh, there's all sorts of reasons. They may turn away from the faith because, because why? Because they are scared of the external opposition. I dare not, you know, even now, uh, sometimes I hear from uh, people that even, uh, even sometimes in office, they dare not tell people that they are Christians. So this is like subtle, Okay, this is not truly turning away from faith. This is just a bit of a coward or, or, or scared, intimidated Christians. But there are people like that, they got intimidated because of external opposition. They dare not reveal that they are Christians. And or people can turn away because 
their motive in following God, God is not met. You know, I follow God to be prosperous, but following Him for 10 years, I didn't see any increase in, in money or, or I didn't get what I want, so they turn away. Or people can turn away because of uh, sin, you know. Uh, they are always stuck in sin and they know that if I want to pursue my sin, my desire, in my inclination, I, I cannot follow God. So they choose sin over Jesus, etc. There's so many, so many different, um, different reasons why people turn away from, from God. But we, know, we also have to uh, ask ourselves, those who, I mean, we never know a person's life until the very end. Some people, they turn away from God a while, but they may come back later on in their life if they are truly elected by God. But for those who never did turn back, we also need to question, were they even believers in the first place? So, if you are true believers, God will surely guard us, preserve us to the end. Uh, we recently read in even the TBRC conference about Psalm 62, where David mentioned he's shaken. Even the elect, sometimes we may be shaken. When we see all these false pros- uh, prophets, when we see the external opposition, sometimes we may also be shaken. But David's word is, I am not very shaken. You know, when God is with us, when He's always uh, reminded of God's truth, we may be shaken in the midst of all these end time signs, but God will still preserve us to the end. And another, another uh, obvious sign of end time is this weakened spirituality where just now we read, uh, the love grows cold. Love towards who? The love, of course, it's the love towards God that first grows cold. People... People first get disinterested with God. I cannot see this God. I cannot feel this God. I cannot sense His presence. I cannot relate to this God. People feel not interested in God, indifferent towards God. And then the natural outcome is they start to feel indifferent also with other people. They start to grow cold in loving others also. But So all these things so far are, are negative things. But thank God there's one positive thing. In the end time, uh, there will be this widespread of evangelism globally. So if this final point outweighs everything. It tells us the very important truth that despite so many problems, the end times will surface. You know, false prophets, wars, external opposition, persecutions, but God prevailed. Despite all this nonsense or all these um, attacks from the evil one, uh, despite all these human weaknesses, God prevails. His purpose prevails. And that's why one of the obvious signs for the end time is this widespread evangelism. And so, all these signs uh, we have mentioned, uh, we have heard many times. So, the question is, have all these signs been fulfilled already? Have all these signs, all these uh, seven signs been fulfilled today? Or even in the apostles' time? or even in Paul's time, actually, all these signs, well, they have certain commonality. It, they are the signs to the end time, but they does not tell us one thing. They does not tell us how much longer are we from the exact date of Jesus coming. They are just signs that Jesus is going to come soon, but it didn't tell us exactly how long more. You know, is it 10 years more? Is it 15 years more? Is it... Uh, 100 years more, I mean, it didn't tell us exactly how much, how, many, how much longer because you realize that all these signs has been repeated over generations. You know, some people even say that all these things have even been fulfilled, even during the time of Paul because, you know, when they say uh, the gospel will be preached to all nations and then the end will come. All nations refers to many people groups, different tribes, different, uh, different ethnic groups. So during Paul's time, they also would think that as long as it's out of Jerusalem, gospel has so-called reached many, many nations, all nations. So it's like used collectively. So this science has been repeated over different, different generations. So it didn't tell us how long more. And so such that because of this repetition, everyone in their generation, they will feel that it's as if Christ is coming tomorrow. Uh, you know, the apostles, they they felt that Christ is coming like very soon in their time. But 2,000 years later, we also feel that God is coming very soon. Uh, 1,000 years ago, people also felt that Jesus is coming very soon. So everyone in their generation, they will feel that, and this is God's exact purpose. Because whichever generation we live in, God don't want us to sit, sit back and relax and think, oh, you know, Jesus is not coming back in my time. I can just wait. He's not coming in my lifetime. Jesus wants us to have the sense of urgency such that 
every generation, he wants people to live as if it is really uh, happening very soon. But like birth pains we read just now, all these are the beginning of birth pains. And so even though it has been repeated, the, the trend is it will be repeated with increasing intensity and shorter interval. It's just like you know, the contraction for pregnancy. As the baby is really coming out, contraction will get more and more painful, faster and faster. This is why I heard, I don't know, is it true, but I think so. So contraction will just get faster and faster. So you will observe that all these signs, yes, although it has been uh, repeated, when we are drawing nearer and nearer to the end, it will get worse and worse. And so these signs remind us to be on our guard. But then we also need to watch out that no one deceive you. Why did Jesus, before he mentioned all these signs, all these signs, he first gave this overarching instruction, watch out that no one deceive you. Because Jesus knows there's a lot of false prophets who will claim that, you know, there's this a big natural disaster that happened. So that's why in year 2020, uh, you know, it will be the end of the world. So even though we need to um, be cautious, be vigilant because of all these signs, we need to watch out that if anyone claims that because any of all these things happen and therefore a specific date, specific year, specific duration, and then Jesus will come again, we need to be mindful that all these two precise predictions are all, all, all fake, all, all unreal. Yet, there must be a purpose why God tells us all these signs. So we continue to read the final portion for today's um, long passage. Actually, I skip a long um, portion from verse 15 to 28 because we already covered in earlier Gospels. We have read about those things already. So we will jump straight to verse 32. Uh, so this is the final short portion for us to complete today. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. So no point, you know, just knowing uh, what are the signs. What is more important is, so what, after we know the sign. And so even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things ha have happened. And so that's why, you know, because of this verse 34, some people say that all these signs that Jesus mentioned before sort of have been have taken place even in the early church uh, era, but it will continue to repeat. And so we also need to be mindful, even in our current generation. And verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So in short, as I mentioned just now, it is no point hearing all these end time signs without relating it to our life, re without relating it to how we live today. And that's why this the third point is the longest I'm going to spend on today. So what does it mean for us after knowing all these, end sign, uh, uh, all these signs of end time? It is of course to watch the signs and therefore be vigilant. Be vigilant, be on our guard. Now, I think this whole thing reminds me of this SG Secure campaign. How many of you have uh, come across this? Uh, and the, the tagline, uh, the, the key phrase they were always saying is, not if, but when. No, they say the terror attack is not, not, a, not a matter of if, but when. And we cannot afford to be complacent. Actually, before this campaign come out, there have been a lot of terrorist attacks across the world. And I've been reading all the news on and off sometimes. But only when this, uh, this very short and sharp message came, then I suddenly braced myself up. Because you know, in Singapore, we are very secured. We're very protected. We almost never see any bomb. I mean, how many of you have watched, have seen any bombing in, bombing in Singapore before? I said, I don't know, even those who have been through the army, I don't know whether you see the real thing or not. <laughs> but maybe yes, I'm in army. But you know, when I, when I see this, then I suddenly sit up and I brace myself to pray a bit more seriously for Singapore. And it, it's like hitting upon me. It's like every time when I wa watch or read certain news, it's all very far away from Singapore. But then when even the government uh, put up this slogan, not if but when, it suddenly dawned on me that as much as we want to prevent something, or as much as we thought we are capable of doing certain things, it's just a matter of time that it was, the same thing will happen to us. And so it is, all, of course, the same for end time. I mean, we, most people, they, they hope. Uh, I, I, uh, we hope that we will not be living in the era where it's the end of the world because it's full of suffering, full of tribulation, the great tribulation will be there. But 
the coming of Jesus, meaning the end of the age, is something even more serious than this. And that's why we need to be prepared for, for it. And we all know that anyone, when we live without a final goal, that person is not so wise. You know, because he just shone aimlessly, he just do a lot of things aimlessly, and he just run around in circle. So a person who never prepares for the coming of Jesus, he just sit there, he just know, oh, Jesus is going to come, come back again. The end of the world is coming soon. And he just sit there and wait. This is not a very wise person. So we know that, we know that the end of the world, the end will definitely come. Because God has not just shown us what are the general signs, but through history, he has, also given, he has also given us signs that uh, the end will certainly come. You know, there's so many, so many uh, symbolic events that point us to the end of the world. Noah's flood is one where people are eating, drinking, marrying, and living life as normal. Suddenly, the flood came. And when people, it's not just eating, drinking, and marrying, and being happy. They ignore, the, they ignore what Noah is doing. No, they ignore the message that God is sending. So they refuse to take in. And when that happens, uh, destruction comes. So that is almost equivalent to the complete destruction of humankind. But of course, God saved Noah's family. And then, of course, there's this destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, God has been waiting and waiting. Uh, I mean, these are the two evil cities uh, famous in the Old Testament. You know, God has been waiting. God didn't kill, God didn't destroy them immediately. But when they keep resisting God's word and they keep piling up their, their evil and their sin, one day they are completely destroyed. Even God's people, now you say, oh, you know, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, they are not God's people. They refuse to, re uh, they, they, you know, they reject God. But even Israel, God's chosen nation, when they, when they refuse to listen to God, they are engulfed in a lot of idolatry of uh, pagan gods. God sent them into exile in the Old Testament. And in, in the New Testament, we heard that the temple was destroyed. And of course, in the more, more modern time, there's World War I, World War II. So there's a lot, a lot of uh, indications across history that tells us even though now we have been living in decades of peace, you know, we are all the fortunate groups. You know, we've never encountered war before. But even though it seems to be very comfortable right now, the end will surely come. So when God's timetable is up, and when Jesus returns, or when our, my own timetable, our own timetable is up, we need to go to heaven. No one can say, God, I don't want to go. So it's not about, uh, so whether we believe it or not, the end will come. So what is important is not so much when this end will come, but the more important question we need to ask and pray about is, are we ready? Are we ready when it comes? Are we ready when Jesus returns? It's not just saying, hello, Jesus, you're here. You know, are we ready when, he, when he's really coming? Actually, honestly, we need to ask ourselves, or I need to ask all of you here, do you wish sincerely in your heart that Jesus will come quickly. How many of you hope that Jesus can come quickly? Best is now. Actually, now is better. We're all sitting in the church. We'll be praised and rewarded. <laughs> so, how many of you sincerely hope that, you know, if you go back tomorrow, uh, go back on Monday, Jesus will come again? How many of you sincerely hope that Jesus can come quickly? You know, different people have different... I, I hope your reason, if any, I hope the only one reason you hope Jesus will not come so fast is no, my father, my mother, my grandmother, my grandfather, my siblings, they are not Christians yet. I still need time to evangelize to them. I still need time to show them and, and share the gospel with them. Not, uh, uh, Jesus don't come. Uh, I, have, I haven't got married yet. You know, just January, I'm going to get, <laughs> wait a few months more. You know, January, after January, then you come. You know, wait till I wear the gown. You know, or, or, you know, or uh, wait till I graduate. Wait till I earn some money. Wait till I can enjoy. Wait till I can travel to Europe. Uh, let me see the Swiss apps. Alps, Alps, and then you come. You know, I hope the reason why we say, you know, tahan, tahan, you know, don't come so fast, is not because we couldn't get enough of the world, but it's really because we are really concerned that there's a lot of people that we care about. There's a lot of people in our family, in our social circles, they have not known the gospel. If Jesus is to come right now, what happens to them? So, are we ready? And how much do we feel the burden, the urgency for people around us who are yet to be safe. So I guess we have mixed feelings. You know why I say mixed? Because on the one hand, by right, we should 
crave for Jesus coming again because that's the best place. You know, sometimes when I get very tired or when I get, I feel life is a bit boring, I will feel, wow, so, it would be wonderful if I can go and rest in heaven. But then, then after that, you, you look around you and you see that so many people that you care about, they are still not inside the door of heaven. Then you start, have, you start to have this mixed feeling that actually it's still okay. You know, God, you delay a bit so that more people can be safe. And so, we need to ask ourselves, how can the person who walks in the worldly way every day, how can this person be prepared to be a witness of Christ, a, a testimony of Christ in times of end-time hardships? So we need to ask ourselves, are we really ready? And the way to be prepared is to live in the right way now. Because we do not know when is Jesus returning. That's why every moment, starting from this second, this minute, we need to live in the right way so, so that we, don't, we are not afraid. You know, even if Jesus is to come right now, we are ready. Even if Jesus is to come next week, if we are still living in the right way, we will be ready. So if you live in the right way every moment, you will be ever ready to receive and to welcome Jesus. And so, Jesus is not telling us all these end time signs uh, just for our information. And then after that, for us to wait and see. You know, I tell you this, uh, it's like a prediction, you wait and see. Of course, He wants us to be faithful in doing the things that God asks us to do right now, today. Uh, the problem with Christians is, I'm not just saying problems with people of the world. The problem even with Christians is they cannot be bothered to relate their life with end time because they are so busy, you know, they are so busy living in a mad rush right now that they have no time to be concerned about what end times, what living for the, for uh, living to be ready to see Jesus. And so we need to, for us who hears this message today, I pray that we can, uh, we can, we can ask God for his help to make us ready. And how can we, so the, the question is, how can we preserve God's mission in our heart and receive daily strength to live it out? How can, we, how can we not just know God's purpose, but also find strength to live out God's purpose in our daily living? The simple answer is we need to connect every day with our master and our HQ in heaven. Because, you know, God's word has this wonderful effect. When we connect every day with our master, meaning when we hear God's voice, when we are reminded of God's truth again, it, is, it will be totally different. You know how, you know what, have you felt and confirmed the effect of God's words? God's word is not just literal black and white words. If we really take in God's word seriously, we realize God's words can open our eyes and our mind. It helps you see things in a different light. And when you see things in a different light, God's word will come and strengthen your heart. You know, our heart is the most vol volatile uh, organ. You know, it's easily shaken. You know, it's easily affected. But God's word has this calming and strengthening effect of our heart. And our heart is the what? Our heart is a wellspring of everything. Our heart is the control center of every decision. So when we hear the word of God, our hearts, our hearts are calm. You realize the word of God will direct our steps. So the word of God is so amazing. It's just word of God. But if you really confirm how effective this word of God is, it opens our mind, it gives you a new perspective, it calms your heart, it gives you strength that you never uh, get when you are in a confused state, and it also directs your, your, your step. You know, when your mind is sober, when your heart is calm, you make the right decision, you move in the right direction, you do the right things, you find strength to do it. So God's word is so amazing, and that's why, how do we live the right way? We cannot just, you know, suddenly, in our fallen nature, it's very hard for us to suddenly wake up one day and then in the morning and say, God, I want to be holy. I want to, you know, we need, we need reminders. We need strength. And the strength comes from connecting with God, hearing His voice, get back to His word again. And so, you may not be coming to church every day, but you have the Bible in your house every day. So every day, connect. Uh, connect. Of course, we, we know connection means we pray to God. But pray to God with what contents? get some content from the Bible. And, you know, the Bible is interesting. It's not, uh, I, okay, I don't know about all of you, at least working at home as full-timer in the church, we have the luxury of reading the Bible every morning in, in, at, house, in, uh, at home, right? So sometimes the Word of God is very amazing. Sometimes you read the Word of God, well, I give you very sobering alert. You know, don't provoke God to anger. Well, it's very scary. 
But on other day, you know, then you read the word of God, it's like God is very soothing. You know, uh, certain people they fail many, many times, but God forgives time and again. So God, God's word gives us very balanced um, strength and perspective. So connect every day. If you want to live right, we need to connect with God through His word and through uh, deep and quiet prayers. And then you will receive power, wisdom, and fruit to live in these end times. And so, uh, God's voice will remind us of not just His truth and His promise. God's voice, when we connect to Him again, He will remind us not just what He says, but He will tell us again what is our purpose on earth. So, connecting to God every day will remind us of our ultimate purpose on earth. Meaning, uh, in summary, is this for gospelization? Okay, in the English service, we seldom mention this term for gospelization. But I thought it's good once in a while to recap, to talk about all these things. Because I think for the English, English congregation, sometimes um, uh, we didn't mention too much about certain summary statements. So if you ask, what is God's purpose for you? I mean, God wants us to do a lot of things. God wants us to work, wants us to study, wants us to get married, etc., etc. But ultimately, in summary, God has four key things He wants us to pray about. And this is the thing that He, this is the reason, this is the focal point of how He guides every one of our life. First is the gospelization of the self, meaning uh, one of the key things that God wants to accomplish in our life is God wants to, God wants each and every one of us to build our relationship with Him, to build our self build our lives up in His truth. And also, God knows, every one of us, before you can even be a vessel, instrument for God, we, we need a lot of healing in our life. You know, healing in a sense, oh, I don't get so easily affected by the world. I don't get so uh, easily deceived and tempted by the devil, and so on. So, uh, one of the goals that God has for our life is God wants us to restore relationship with Him. God wants us to build ourselves in the truth. God wants us to be healed first. So about our own blessedness. Uh, only when you restore strength and relationship with God, then you are able to bless your family. You know, otherwise, you don't even need to speak a word to your family. Your family look at the way you are, you know, the way you think, the way you uh, pursue things in life. They, will, they may not even be interested in the gospel, you say. So only when ourselves is well connected with God, then we are equipped to bless our family. And also, our regional fields, uh, which includes our schools, our workplace, our neighbourhood, and also to play a part in world, evangeliz world evangelism. Especially in times like this. You know, some people will say, you know, last time when I hear this, um, I think about, is it two decades ago? Maybe 15 or 18 years ago? When I first hear all these things, I more or less can relate to the first three. You know, self gospelization family, regional. This word gospelization, I always think, ah, this is so grand, this is too big. But the good news is we are living in the internet age. So we have come to a point where we don't even need to be like pastor. I mean, of course, you want to be like him, tra literally travel around the world, also can. But if we are not, if we happen not to have that kind of calling to be real missionary around the world, we can, we can even do evangelism, world evangelism, without stepping out of our house or leaving our country. Because people are traveling to our country, right? A lot of migrants, a lot of foreign talents. And even on the internet, we can do a lot of evangelism. So we can pray. How to live the right way now? We know the end is coming and it will definitely come. So we can pray. How can we play a role to insert a Christian voice in the global market, in the global world? This is something that you and I, we can pray about. No matter how small we are. You know, uh, I shared yesterday in my SSG, but today I also share again. Uh, I think, I don't know, is it this year or last year? Me and Elder Zeming, we actually attended a Christian seminar uh, run by uh, this Christian editor in the local newspaper. And he shared about this social media Christian influence, which I find it quite interesting because he addressed people like me who are small fry in the, in the society, who are not very active in social media, but he explained how even a small fry can make an impact in the social media, in the, in the, in the internet world, and to have a Christian voice for God. Because he will say something like, okay, first he addressed, some, he allayed some of, some of our fears. Because nowadays, 
a lot of times it, we may have the desire to do online evangelism, but we're very scared of backlash. We're very scared of retaliation. Oh, if I say something very Christian, what if my friend all hate me? What if I offend certain people? What if people think I'm very biased and narrow-minded? You know, we have, we have a lot of fears. So the first thing that this Christian uh, editor, he said this, he said that, uh, first of all, you know that there are more people on our side than the negative criticism that you heard online. Because there could be only 10 activists against Christian. But these 10 activists, they are very loud. They say a lot of things. You Christian are stupid, uh, narrow-minded, uh, you are, don't, know, don't know what. And they say it very harsh. So we get very scared. But actually, there are thousands and hundreds and um, more people who are still conservative, who still holds on to the value of God. But they are quiet. They are neutral, like you and I. You know, we, we are quiet. We, we don't dare to say anything or, remain, or we remain neutral or we don't see a need to do anything. But he said that actually the truth is there's more people who may share the same convictions as us. So that, that allays one of the uh, first fear. And then he said that, don't think that every action is too small. Um, if you are afraid to write an article because you, or write a comment because you scared people um, uh, scold you, at least a like, you know, you like a Christian article or you like a Christian, it can be a Christian article on a social issue like LGBT or uh, environmental issue or whatever. Or it can be a, even a theological article, you know, only Jesus safe. Wow, if you did not write such things and you scared your, your friend think you are too narrow-minded, what, what do you mean by only Jesus? What about other religion? Just a simple light can have an impact, you know, because... I, and because he is the editor, so he, he knows that you know, sometimes when government make a uh, policy, let's say he, if the government want to pass a law, should there be same-sex attraction, uh, uh, same-sex marriage legalization? Then he will, I mean, we may not say certain things, but we can, but the government will see, you know, how many people like this article. Wow, 200k people like this article about uh, against same sex. So the government may think, okay, so more people actually prefer to be conservative, even though we don't have a, you know, we don't put a name to our stand. So there's certain impact and not, not just social issue. If a neutral person, they are considering different religion. Say for example, a, a, very, a very neutral secondary school student trying to explore religion, a faith to believe in. So he may read a Buddhist article, a Christian article, and then uh, read, you know, and so when certain article garners more attention, popularity, actually to a neutral person trying to find a faith, maybe it also makes certain impact. So no action is too small. So you know when I, when I attend this seminar, this thing uh, left a deep impression in me. So sometimes I like an article. Uh, it, can, it can be an article uh, from theology to social issue, but don't think that a lie is, in, don't be too lazy even to lie something because it's a voice it's a voice in the global market it's a voice for christ but of course if you are more courageous you can write some comment appropriately but not a comment to debate and get into arguments with people unnecessarily you can write some comments to put a stand across uh, to edify certain people and if you are even more courageous you can write an article yourself about your certain stand about lgbt or about why jesus is the only way to heaven why other people why why other religion cannot work why only jesus can save you you can do you can try to do that because it's really how to say it's really different different ways of getting and nowadays people are very sensational you know they look at numbers they look at uh, reach i mean although we who follows christ we always say uh, it's not about numbers, it's not about, but we need to know the target audience we are reaching out to. They are very sensational. Even though we don't appeal to their senses all the time, we don't advocate healing and deliverance all the time, but we need to know that people sense by the extent of uh, agreement, consensus, and so on on the ground. So there are different things we can do. If we know the purpose of God is self, family, regional, and world gospelization, there's always room for our prayers. We cannot say that, oh, world is too far away. I can pray for regional, I can pray for family, I can pray for myself, but I don't need to pray for world gospelization. Right now in this generation, we have no excuse so far uh, because there's little things that we can do to impact the gospel even at the world level. Uh, just now I forgot to say, uh, if, uh, you can even forward. So you can like, you can forward. You may not comment. You know, I think very few people dare to comment because comment is the dangerous part where the the harsh response may come. But you can forward. Okay, forward also. Forward, people also say, I forward, what if people comment on my forward post? 
I don't know if you are. So sometimes we need to, we need to take some risks for the gospel. And so this move, uh, this leads me to the next point. Live the right way. Uh, the right, the right way is to connect to God every day, to equip yourself, family, regional, and the. Uh, the third thing I want to explore a bit more is this evangelism. When I say doing the right thing, the most correct thing to do is to be involved in evangelism in the end time. Because the Bible says the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So if you know, so from today's passage, it's very clear. This world is not just our home. It is not really a, a lasting place to stay. And so, if you know that a certain place is somewhere you cannot stay for long before it collapses, then what's the natural response? You need to quickly find a way out, right? Just like you know, um, recently the Thai cave incident, no matter how long those 13 people, they have been able to survive well in the cave. They have been successful in staying alive in the cave. But you and I, and even they themselves know, it will not last for long. Yeah, they can stay for two weeks there in the cave. But if the water level rise again, they cannot, they cannot live forever there. So no matter how difficult, you need to find a way out. Same thing for this world. No matter how comfortable we are in this world, you know, sometimes we are so comfortable that we forget this is not our home. We forget this is not a permanent place. Because we have been surviving well in this world. We can make friends, we earn money, we can enjoy even certain leisures. We, we are so comfortable in this world. But we need to know that one day, as we have been reading and remind, being reminded that all this will end. So we must quickly find a way to, to save ourselves and people around us, no matter how difficult it is. So, same thing. Is evangelism difficult? It's difficult. Like the, like the Thai, Thai cave, you know, I was telling CJ, and I don't know how to swim. I was saying, if I'm the one, I asked him, what will you do if I'm the one stuck in the cave? I think I, I, I told him, you better start preparing my funeral because I, I don't think I'll even dare to swim, I don't know what, uh, be chaperoned by the two divers. I think I'll just stay there and die and say, God, just take me home. Can I imagine myself crawling through the, don't know, all the waters and all the narrow cracks? So I'll just stay there and die, maybe. So it's so dangerous. But the thing is, if you don't try, there's really no chance. It, that's, it's so difficult. You know, people were saying it's so, so, the risk is so high, but no risk, no chance at all. Same thing for evangelism. Is it difficult? It's of course difficult because there's also risk. There's risk of what people disliking us, people getting offended with us. There's risk of the whole family turning against us. You know, sometimes when I go to my extended family gathering, I want to say some things. But usually in the extended family, there's a lot of people. So when I talk to one auntie, there'll be two other, two or three or a group of people staring at me. So it's like, there'll be risk if I say anything wrong, the whole gang will attack me or something. Or every, and they're all like my seniors. I'm the juniors. So, so, it's, so there's certain risk. There's certain risk of uh, getting off, uh, offending people. There's certain risk of spoiling relationship. But I draw one lesson from the Thai cave incident. If you just give up, it's really all die, all, all dead. Everybody just prepare the funeral. But if it's something important, something is real, no matter how difficult it is, we still have to try. Even though we face the risk of rejection, even though we face the risk of humiliation, mockery, we still have to try. And so, especially in dark times, we need to evangelize. Because you know that if you look at ourselves, darkness evokes special reaction in people. For Christians, in time of darkness, do you realize you pray more? You're driven to pray more. Even those who are indifferent to prayer, in dark moments, in dark periods, they pray more. They pray more earnestly. And for people of the world, they may be living in an indifferent way, you know, YOLO, or whatever, but when dark times come, suddenly they have this need for God. They have this humility in them. So actually, uh, every dark period, like we always say, end time is dark period. Every dark period is a period of blessing for people like uh, Noah, Daniel, Samuel, etc. in the Bible. Because in every period of darkness, God will prepare and God calls the person whom he wants to use in that generation. And who are such people like? And we, we need to ask ourselves, are we people like that? In every pe period of darkness, when you see rumors of wars, when you see 
persecutions to Christians, when you hear about terrorist attack, when you hear about natural resources depleting, when you hear all these things and sense all this darkness, do you mourn for your generation? Meaning, God is looking for people who are not, not just busy with our life, busy about uh, getting our salary increment, busy about buying the next house, busy about preparing for my wedding, or busy about when my child will, uh, when to give birth to the next child, etc. Is when we see all this darkness arising, do we mourn for our generation? This is the reaction of people whom God used greatly. You know, Daniel, even Abraham, they pray for their generation. Moses, he mourned for his people. And when you mourn for your generation, then you will start to have this desire to restore the Emmanuel God, to restore the fear of God, to restore the presence of God, to restore the, 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 the worship of God in our community. And so today, I pray that we will be such people like that, that God can use. Uh, and if you're very clear about God's mission for you, you realize that you realize that you'll be very assured and brave. Uh, you know, just like, if you're very assured, God keeps me on earth, not just to shake leg and wait for the end to come. God has a purpose for me. I need to rescue people and bring them to Christ. If you're very clear of your mission, then you'll be so assured and confident like Paul. You know, Paul, he ever faced a shipwreck on his way to Rome. Everybody on the ship was so, so scared, but he prayed and God told him, don't be afraid. You and all the 200 people with you on this ship, you will arrive safely in Rome because you will face Caesar. Because God, because so Paul, he knows God will preserve his life because he has to testify in Rome. So when you have this clear uh, mission from God, you'll be very secure. And, but then, on the other hand, you realize that when we are not clear about our mission, or rather, we know our mission, but we are not interested to live out that mission, do you sense what will be the natural reaction that always comes to us? All kinds of fears will grip us. All kinds of fears. You know, when you know that you're not living for God, you're just living for yourself, uh, you're living selfishly, then you realize that we will have all kinds of fears. You know, we'll be worried. Uh, we'll be worried whether God will uh, give me good job and good prospects in, job, uh, in the job because God knows I'll be proud. Right? Uh, we will be worried, will my money be enough? Because God knows uh, I will live selfishly if I have a lot of money. So will God give me a lot of money? So we have all kinds of funny, funny fears. And then when we take the plane, we will start to worry maybe, uh, will the plane crash? Uh, I mean, maybe God thinks I'm better off in heaven than wasting time and indulging in all the temptation in the world. You know, so we have all kinds of fears when we are not living for the purpose of God. But we will be brave when we are, very, when we are clear about what God wants us to do on this earth. We are brave in the sense, you know, if one day you realize that, hey, my weakness can actually bring out the strength and the comfort of God, then I will not just feel very inferior and lousy in my weakness, but I'll be brave to profess my weakness and, you know, just like, just like Paul. I delight in, in weaknesses, I delight in uh, suffering because then when I'm strong and when I'm weak, God is strong. So if you realize that, you know, a lot of times people, they are not brave. When they feel that they are weak in certain areas, they just feel very inferior. They feel very lousy about themselves. They feel very self-pity. Why, why are other people so good? Why am I so pitiful? But then, when we are clear about our mission, even if we may not be the richest person, smartest person, we can be brave. And we can, and we can be brave to use our weakness to testify for God. And so, how can we live with hope on earth? How can we live with hope in this world that is passing away? If you have been doing the right thing all the time, then you have no reason to be afraid. Yes, the world, the world is ending, the great tribulation is coming, but we need not be afraid if you are living in the right way now. And so, as I said, the right way is to evangelize. And Pastor last week also gave us this prayer topic that we can try to save one soul in our Feels right, whether it's in your workplace or in your so one soul is not many, but it's not difficult, it's not easy also. So we need to pray. In the world where love is growing colder, distractions are multiplying, we need to live right so that we will not be deceived. Okay, so this is a summary for today's message. You see all these things, all these fanciful things, attractive things, successful, lovely things, they will pass away. Do not be deceived. 
and watch out that no one deceive you because there's a lot of people offering solution, offering meaning to life, freedom, happiness, but those are not the way. We need to live in the right way now, and the most pressing thing is to uh, evangelize, is to save ourselves and others when we still have the time. Okay, shall we pray? Dear Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for your message today. Lord, we know that it's not the first time we've been hearing this, but Lord, this is one of the most critical reminders we need to bear in mind because when we live on earth, it is so fast and so easy for us to forget that this world is not our home, for us to forget that the end is coming soon, for us to forget that all these things that attracts us and that's occupying our minds are one day, um, are one day without value. So Lord, we thank you for your reminder because when we, remind, when we remember this correctly, then we will live in the right direction right focus, right priorities. Lord, we pray that you do not just let us know about this, but I pray that you can empower us with the strength to live in alignment to this uh, plan and purpose of yours. So Lord, even though we are weak, we pray that you give us a willing heart to live as your testimony in these end times and you give us the strength to not get shaken by the world, but to continue to live in the way that pleases you. And I pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.